Good morning, everyone. Uh, we thought we'd change up locations today and do it a little bit different. We're going to open the Word of God today and really uh, lean in to hear His voice. Uh, will you pray with me as we um, open His Word? Father God, we thank You that You want to speak to us, that You um, have an encouragement for our hearts, uh, even for this day and for this week. We ask, Lord God, that You would help us to listen. There's lots of distractions, lots of things going on in homes and I pray, Lord God, right now just for your peace to come. I pray that every distraction would um, be gone and that people would have a chance just to press in and listen to all you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today uh, we're beginning a new series and today um, the title of our message is An Isolation Invitation. And I found this funny video on um, uh, something came up on my Instagram feed this week and I thought kind of describes uh, the situation for a lot of us at home right now. Hi everybody, just thought I'd give you a quick update. Um, I think we're on day, I don't know, whatever day it is. Uh, but I just want to tell you that here at home, we're just having such a great time. Everybody is just wonderful. They, um, you know, we get up in the morning and we're just so fortunate with uh, how well we get along and spending all this time together. Uh, I mean, we're, we're doing puzzles, we're, we're helping each other. Um, you know, in times like this, it just brings everybody um, close to the next level. You know, the kids are in their 20s. I've been married to Charlie. Uh, for, I don't know, 28 years, and I, I just can't, I'm just overwhelmed with um, appreciation of who we are um, as a family, and I just cannot wait for the, uh, the next four weeks that we're just going to be here at home, and I'm just really fortunate, so I thought I'd give you a quick update. How funny was that? You know what? If that describes your week in social isolation during school holidays, then blessings to you. If it doesn't, you've had a fabulous week. Uh, it's your turn to call someone and encourage them. Um, we're going to look at an invitation that God has for us today. Uh, and if you're taking notes, we've titled this message, An Isolation Invitation. You know, in um, John the 10th chapter, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. He said it a different way in Matthew 10, 27. These are Jesus' very words. He says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. What is God whispering in this season? It's easy for us to get uh, locked up in all the noise. Maybe your house is really quiet. Maybe your house is, you know, chaotic. Uh, maybe there's been some fights this week, lots of people in the same house. Maybe it's been really peaceful. I'm not too sure how your week has been. But I think the interesting thought is that no matter the volume, no matter how busy or quiet things are, that God wants to speak to you in this season. You know, I was reading something this week and often... And, you know, I'll seek the Lord for a direction for it, the year or a word for the year. And even um, this encouragement that um, I was reading just said, you know what, in this season, it might be time to seek the Lord for the word for the week or the word for the day. And so just that sense of leaning in, tuning our ears to hear his voice. My sheep, Jesus said, listen to my voice. They know my voice and they follow me. And uh, there's a beautiful story in the scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to unpack it a little bit today. We're going to go quick. We're going to unpack it. And I want to just bring out some application points for us that really are pertinent for us in this season. A uh, bit of context. Elijah is a prophet to um, the Israelites. And he, um, he's been going through a little bit of a rough time. And um, you go ahead and read the story in 1 Kings. But we come to 1 Kings 18 and 19. He has a showdown with 850 prophets um, of Baal. And 
he is victorious, and then all of a sudden, um, people are unhappy that he has won. Um, if you look at the end of chapter 18, uh, verse 45, so it says, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with crowd, clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking in his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezebel. Um, chapter 19 says, Now Ahab told Je Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to, messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. So, you know, ever had a death threat? This is Elijah's situation. Um, he thought he was doing the right thing. You know, he was moving in the power of God. The scripture just says the power of the Lord came on Elijah. And now within moments, it seems in the scripture, but within days, uh, there's a death threat against him and he's running away. And now this whole scenario begins to unpack. And that may be you. You might have been in full flight, work's going great, in victory. You've just won. And now all of a sudden, uh, things are all up in the air. And that is how it was for Elijah. Verse 3, it says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. And he said these words. And if you haven't uttered these words in the last four weeks, maybe, or even in... Um, the recent history, then uh, you've been doing really well because these are his words. I've had enough, Lord. And I felt like this was an invitation for someone that literally you've said to God, I've had enough. I've had enough of these kids. I've had enough of this house. I've had enough of this pressure. I've had enough of you go ahead and fill in the blank. It might be just, I've had enough of cooking dinners and no one saying thank you. It might be as simple as, I've had enough of this messy house. I've had enough of the anxious thoughts. I've had enough, whatever it is. This, this story in the scriptures is here for us today. And Elijah said, I have had enough, Lord. And then he says this, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. This is a man in depression. This is a man who had sunk to the lowest of the lows. He had hit rock bottom and he is crying out to God. Have you been there? I've been there. And they're those situations that the scriptures include so that it doesn't matter how much we've moved in the power of God. It doesn't matter the anointing on our life. It doesn't matter all that we've been able to do and work for the Lord. We still have moments where we cannot comprehend all that's going on. We don't understand things. We're not supposed to go this way. And we find ourselves before God running away even if it's not physically, maybe even just emotionally distancing ourselves and literally saying to God, I have had enough. You know, uh, in this, right here in this point where Elijah was at his lowest, he made three mistakes that I can see. And I don't think he's alone. If you ever look though, here's the first one. He ran himself to the ground. Uh, verse uh, three of chapter 19 says Elijah was afraid and ran for his life and when he came to Bathsheba in Judah he left his servant there. Bathsheba was about a hundred well we know it's about a hundred miles from where he was. So think in distance from Sydney to the Hunter Valley. He ran from Sydney to the Hunter Valley. He is now exhausted, tired, spent and he's making decisions He's making eternal, like lifelong decisions. Like, that's it. I've had enough. Take my life, God, when he's tired and spent and done. And then he makes his second mistake. It says, when he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there. He shut the people out that he needed the most. He went isolated. You know, I think in this season of social distancing, we don't have to socially isolate to the point that we're not contacting people, we're not reaching out for help, we're not asking. We can isolate ourselves. And here's the third mistake he made. He began to focus on the negative. You'll look down in verse 10. Um, he's talking to the Lord and he goes on and he says, 
I've been zealous for you, God. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Totally focusing in on the negative. We'll read a little bit later that he probably had a narrow perspective and God saw a bigger perspective. But I think we can make these three mistakes. When we've had enough, when things are going a bit tough, that is not the time to make a permanent decision. You know, we're talking with, Chris and I were talking this week and um, he said this line, I think we've said it before, but I thought it was interesting. Don't make temporary decisions. Don't make permanent decisions on temporary situations. Don't make a permanent decision on a temporary situation. Now's not the time to go about making huge permanent change when circumstances may be in your life are temporary. And Elijah was saying, you know what, God, I've had enough. Just kill me now. The funny thing is the very reason why he was running was because Jezebel wanted to kill him. And now he runs himself ragged. He says no. He shuts himself out. He shuts the people that will help him out. He's feeling sorry for himself. And now he asks God for the very thing that he ran away from. Now he says, God, just kill me. We do that. This, this dichotomy of, of feeling that we can have when we get spent and done. I absolutely love God's reply. And it, um, and it says, he's saying, I'm no better than he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he laid back down again. You know, sometimes we think that every solution God's going to give us is going to be really spiritual. You know, God's going to, you know, do a real... And the most spiritual thing right here the angel did, you need to eat and you need to sleep and you need to rest. And that's exactly what he did. So don't despise a time where it's just stripping everything back. You know what? When you're this low, let's just get up. Let's just do what we need to do. Eat, drink, sleep. Then verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. What does this say? God knows where you're at. He knows what the journey looks like. He knows how you're going about it. And he's more than aware, not only of your physical, con of your spiritual condition, but of your physical condition. He knew that Elijah was in no place, no place to carry the journey out without more sustenance and nourishment in his body. And God knows where you're at, friend, too. And so he got up and he ate and he drank, strengthened by that food strengthened by that food he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb the mountain of God you know we read in the uh, scriptures and we see Horeb what we don't maybe know is that Horeb is another word interchangeable with another um, term that we know maybe Mount Sinai same place Horeb Mount Sinai we believe it's the same place and so right here um Elijah, for 40 days and 40 nights, is walking. So where is he going? To the wilderness. You know, if I was thinking about the wilderness, you know, in the scriptures right now, this would be a classic wilderness time. We're all separated into our separate spaces. Uh, we're a little bit isolated. But all through the scriptures, it was the wilderness where God would encounter his people. It was the wilderness where, um, you know, the cloud... The pillar of um, fire and the cloud would cover the Israelites. It was in the wilderness that he would provide food. And do you see the same parallels? The, the cloud, the fire, the food, the nourishment. God knows how to provide for us in seasons of, in wilderness seasons. And Elijah runs there. Interesting, the whole 40 days and 40 nights. What does that tell you? There's about to be, you know, Noah... Um, was in the ark 40 days and 40 nights. What's that saying? When, when Noah came out of the ark with his family, the earth was different. It was a brand new, fresh start. 40 days and 40 nights. He's in the wilderness. And as he's in the wilderness, going to the mountain of God, there's a sense that 
on the other side of this wilderness is transformation. On the other side of this encounter with God is the promises of God. On the other side is something amazing as he would step into this second chapter, this brand new uh, chapter in his destiny and his story. And he comes to the mountain of God and it says, and there he went into a cave and he spent the night. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. Elijah had been on the run. He'd been in fight mode with the prophets and then he'd been in flight mode. And now he's, he's um, coming and he's isolated. He's by himself in a cave. Check out this picture on the screen. It's a, a picture of um, where they think possibly is Elijah's cave on um, Horeb or Mount Sinai. He's in the cave for the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Do you think God didn't know where he was? Why is he asking him the question? You know, I think it's the same thing where when you catch your kids um, in the wrong place or, you know, this week gone out to the garage only to find, you know, boxes cut up and random pieces everywhere. And you kind of go out and even though I know my kids are in the garage, I've gone out and go, what are you doing in the garage? And God comes out and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been zealous for you. He starts giving his, well, this is why I'm here, God. You can sense the frustration. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Listen. And the Lord said, Go out and stand by the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. I love the fact that God didn't answer any of his objections. He didn't refute, he didn't refute him yet. He didn't go through and say, well, well, Elijah, yes, you've been hunted. He didn't do any of that. He answered his pain with his presence. And I don't know what you're facing today. God's not scared of you coming to him. He can handle all that you throw onto him. Scripture says, cast your care on him. He cares for you. He can handle it. He's not worried about it. And as you cast yourself onto him, he answers by saying, I am with you. My presence is with you. And so he says to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. It says, and then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Okay, if you were standing there on the edge of a, of a cliff and all of a sudden you watched and the mountains were being torn apart, fear of God is honestly going to be ripping through your soul. And then it says, and it shattered the rocks before the Lord. Did you read that? It shattered the rocks before the Lord. Before the Lord. So God wasn't in the wind. All of that was happening before the Lord. Where is the Lord? Elijah is standing in his presence. When, your earth, when the earth around you starts to quake, when everything is shattering and falling apart, God is with you. And all that is happening is happening before his eyes. He sees and he knows. And it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Be very careful when you hear of earthquakes and you hear of things happening throughout the earth about proclaiming judgment. Be very, very careful. Because God's not always in the earthquake and he's not always in the shattering of the mountains. Be careful that you don't just put a blanket. Well, that must be the judgment of God. We don't know. That's not our business. Our, our um, job is to discern and to listen and to pay attention for the voice and the presence of God. It says, and after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now, we know that he'd been in the fire in the wilderness with the people of Israel before. So we know that God, God can be in the fire, but right now he wasn't in the fire. Don't just think, oh, well, God did something this way. So he's going to do it that way again. God is doing a new thing, friends. 
He's doing a new thing. And it says, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. You know, God can do the remarkable, but he wasn't in the remarkable. God can do loud, but he wasn't in the loud. God can do dramatic. But this time he wasn't in the dramatic. God was in the quiet. God was in the still, small voice. The NIV and the NLT says, And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Interesting that we don't hear that he put his cloak over his face for the earthquake. We don't hear that he pulled his cloak over his face for uh, the shattering of the mountains or the fire. But when he heard the gentle whisper, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, verse 13, and went out and stood at the mountain cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? In fact, it wasn't in that tone. It was like this. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, right on the screen right now, you'll see a definition for whisper. And a whisper means to speak very softly using one's breath rather than one's throat, especially for the sake of confidentiality. So it's not like he's, <clears throat> what are you doing here, Elijah? That's not the picture here. Speak to, to speak very softly using one's breath rather than their throat. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah then repeats the same complaint. I don't know about you, but if the mountains had shattered all before me, the rocks had gone, the earthquake, the fire... You know, that's a pretty dramatic entrance for then the still small voice. And he still gives his complaint. He's in the pits, you guys. And we've been there. You've been there. He is down in the dumps and he says this. I've been very zealous for the Lord God. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and put your off prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. And God says this. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Verse 18 says this. It says, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. What's he saying? What's God saying? Elijah, you're not the only one. You think you're the only one who is doing my work. You think you're the only one who's out there trying your best. Elijah, there's 7,000 who, who have honored me and who haven't bowed to Baal. But what's he saying? In this encounter, Elijah, I'm not interested really in going back. I'm interested in you moving forward. I'm interested in your destiny. In this encounter, God will give Elijah divine direction for the next phase of his life. And I firmly believe that in this time in his life, that God wants to give him in your life, that God wants to give you divine direction. That when you come out of this season, that when we come out of this season at a church, we're not going to be the same. I've watched so many of you come and drop groceries off this week and, you know, pensioners and and. Are different ones, families and single moms, all you know, going beyond and stretching beyond their means to reach out to the poor, to reach out to those in our community in need. We are not coming out of this the same. I've watched as, as so many of us have joined in online to pray. I've watched as the women have started engaging and tomorrow uh, even the men are going to have their group and journal together. I've watched the youth get online and the kids Zoom parties and the seniors as they've encouraged one another. Church, we are not coming out of this the same. If anything, we realize that we need each other. We miss each other. When you go into the cave, you're not meant to come out different. You're meant to come out different. 
when you encounter the presence of God, you can't leave the same. Isaiah would say it this way in Isaiah 30, verse 21. He says it this way. He says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. A whisper requires two things. It requires you to draw close and it requires you to lean in. You know, I love this story um, by Charles Spurgeon. Um, have you ever had a God whisper? You couldn't quite pinpoint. You know, I've never audibly heard the voice of God, but there have been many times in my life where just that God nudge, that whisper, and I knew, I knew that I knew that it was God. Um, I love this story. There's a guy called John Eglin. He'd never preached a sermon before in his life. Never. It wasn't that he didn't want to. He just didn't need to. But then one morning he did. The snow left his town of Costa, England, buried in white. And when he woke up on that January Sunday in 1850, he thought of, of staying home. Why or who would go to church in such weather? But he listened to the God whisper. He reconsidered. He was, after all, a deacon. And if deacons don't go to church in the snow, who would? So he put on his boots, hat and coat and walked the six miles to the Methodist church. He wasn't the only member who considered staying home. In fact, he was one of the few who came that day. Only 13 people were present, 12 members and one visitor. Even the minister was snowed in. Someone suggested that they go home and Eglin would hear none of it. He was listening to the God whisper. They'd come this far, they would have a service. Besides, they had a, vis a visitor, a 13-year-old boy. But who would preach? Eglin was the only deacon, so by default it fell to him. And so he did. His sermon lasted only 10 minutes. It drifted and wandered, made no point in an effort to, in an effort to make several. But at the end, an uncharacteristic courage settled upon him. He lifted his eyes and looked straight at the boy and challenged, young man, look to Jesus, look, look, look. Did the challenge make a difference? Let the boy now, a man, answer, I did look. And then and there the cloud on my heart lifted, the darkness rolled away, and at that moment I saw the sun. The boy's name? Charles Haddon Spurgeon. England's Prince of Preachers, because one deacon heard the God whisper on a snowy Sunday morning. Um, many of you know I play the piano, and um, not that I can play Beethoven's Fifth, Sym Fifth Symphony, but I love it. Um, uh, you'll recognize the tune, da -na -na -na, da -na -na -na, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It's interesting to me that if you look at the music, the music starts with an eighth rest. It doesn't start with a, or an audible note. It starts with a rest. And it starts in silence to prepare you for the symphony. It starts in silence to prepare you for the symphony. In this time of isolation, even as we come to a close, the social distancing and being away from others, could it be that God wants to get you in the silence? Could it be that he wants to get you alone so that you can hear the God whisper? Whispers require you to draw near to hear and to lean in. Even as that symphony starts with a rest, Starts with silence. You know, uh, I think we underestimate silence even in our prayer walk. I uh, heard this quote this week that silence in, in prayer isn't passive praying, it's active listening. When you stand before the Lord, bend your ear to hear his voice. If you're still long enough, 
you'll hear his voice. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray that you would tune your heart to hear his voice. If there was one skill that I would endeavour to teach you as people that I adore and love, it would be that you would hear his voice. Every other voice, your family's voice, your parents' voice, your husband or wife's voice, your kid's voice, every other voice will grow dim. But his voice will guide you and lead you to eternity. My sheep know my voice. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray that we would hear your voice, that we would silence our hearts, we would silence the temperature of our environments, we would hear you, that we wouldn't assume that you're in the dramatic and that you're in the, the remarkable, but Lord God, when you speak to us in the ordinary moments of our lives, I pray that we would hear the God whisper. Help us, Lord God, to discern, to tune our ears to hear your voice. We need to hear you in this time. Thank you for this invitation to draw close, to lean in, to hear you and to follow you. Thank you that out of this encounter awaits us transformation and a brand new chapter in our lives personally and in our lives as a church family. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.